the book of the Nazarim and the book of John the Enlightened of Elohim were included together in a text known as the Gospel of the Kaleidi, meaning wise strangers. The origins of this work are debated, as no original manuscripts have ever been found. However, it is commonly believed that the books were preserved and passed down by Celtic believers in the 1500s after previously being saved from arson, possibly either the burning of the Library of Alexandra or the Glastonbury Abbey fire in 1184. It has been tucked away alongside a secular work known as the Colburn. However, they don't remotely share any similarities. Whether this is a complete and divinely inspired text can certainly be debated. Nevertheless, we do believe that it contains the words from our Messiah that were not captured in the canonical gospel accounts. As stated by the Apostle John, if everything the Messiah did were recorded, all of the books in the world could not contain them. In this volume, you will find astonishing parables, new and old, that will challenge your walk. Join us as we test this book allowing the Spirit of the Most High to guide us unto what is true. Hey, shalom, and welcome back, brothers and sisters. Welcome to the Parable of the Vineyard stream. My name is Adam, and I welcome you. This is part 23 of our line-by-line -line reading and uh, discussion about the book of the Nazarene. We're going to be finishing up chapter 16 this week, and I pray it's a blessing for you. If some of you are, like, are, are new and you're like, what is the book of the Nazarene? Uh, well, it's a book that was preserved uh, through, the, through the Celtic believers, and it seems to be uh, another um, witness uh, to the gospel, the gospel accounts, the, the life of, of Messiah, supposed, possibly written by Joseph of Arimathea. And uh, most people would say, oh, it's not in the Bible, I'm not going to read it. Okay, so be it. Um, but for some people that are looking into it, reading it, I have to say, for my, at least for myself, and I've heard from others, that this has just been a, an absolute blessing uh, to refine our walk. Uh, just a reminder, Proverbs 25.2 says, It is the glory of Elohim to conceal a thing. But the honor of kings is to search out a matter. I'm sorry about the video flashing thing on my face. I don't know what's up with my camera. I've tried to fix it, but I hope it's not a huge distraction. But the, the point is, um, it the book is here. It's in our lap. We can either read it or not. And I've decided to read it and share the goodness that's come out of it. Uh, so anyways, with that being said, let's pray. Uh, we'll blow some shofars together and we'll get right into chapter 16. Uh, so let's pray. Father Yahweh, we just bless you, and we thank you for sending your son, Messiah Yahusha, uh, for the reconciliation of our sins. Father, we just ask that you bless us with your Holy Spirit, your Ruach HaKodesh, that we may read these words and glean, Father, and to be conformed to the image of your son, Messiah Yahusha, uh, to be walking in righteousness as he taught us, as you instructed him, Father. And uh, we just thank you so much. Please be with us tonight, Father, as we, as we abide in your word. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, so with that, uh, shofar, get your shofars ready. We're going to do a shofar blow. <laughs> Praise the Most High. All right, so here we are, Nazarene chapter 16. We're going to start actually at verse 19 because we ended at 23, I think, um, but we're going to go back, verse 19, we're going to cover a couple extra things so that we didn't cover a few weeks ago. So, Nazarim 16, 19, it says, One of the other disciples said, It is very difficult to live a life which is wholly good. Yahushua answered, It is even more difficult to enter into the greater life of the Spirit. The word surprised those hearing them, but Yahushua assured the disciples about him that it was true, adding, nothing worthwhile is ever easily gained. We talked about this a few weeks ago. Um, I gave an analogy of my from my childhood. Probably wasn't the best analogy. Uh, some of you probably have your own analogies of uh, how you know. Like, It's like when you go on a journey. It's like the journey is half the fun. It's not just about the destination. Just getting there, right, is, is also fun. Like the road trip is fun. But um, the struggles, uh, I don't know if you've ever, you know, had to 
just a hard time in something. But when you, if you're honest with yourself and you look back and you're like, oh gosh, you know, I really gained strength through that struggle. But the point is, is I, uh, Messiah continues to remind us that this road is going to be hard. I mean, he says it's very difficult. It, it's easy, uh, you know, of course, we, as we know, it's easy to live according to the world. It's easy to indulge in the lusts. It's easy to be rude, be angry. That's all that comes normally from the flesh. But this walk, it can be hard. Let's be honest with each other. I'm not trying to sugarcoat anything. This walk can be hard. Um, I, I wouldn't say, you know, like keeping Shabbat's not hard. I mean, okay, take a day off of work and don't go to the store and don't buy stuff. You know, that's not hard. Celebrate festivals that honor his son, like Passover. And that's not hard. What can be hard is dealing with each other uh, and just dealing with others in general, not even just brethren, but just you know, dealing with others. Acts 14, 19 through 22. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. So he's literally getting stoned for sharing the good news. Why do you think that we're going to have a even ha- have an easier time? Messiah said, if it happened to me, it's going to happen to you. It happened to the apostles. They all gave up their lives for the, for the good news. What well, makes us think that we're not going to have a rough time when we do this? Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of Elohim. So Paul didn't preach some easy, greasy grace. You just believe, you go on about your life as normal. Everything's going to be fine. Red carpet's going to be rolled out wherever you go. No. It's like, how many times did he get stoned? How many times did he get shipwrecked? I mean, how many times did he suffer for the gospel's sake? What did our Messiah suffer for just coming, what? Teaching the truth, teaching obedience to the Torah, and focusing on our love for each other. And for that, for some whatever reason, people hated. We'll talk more about that in a second. Mark 10, 26 through 31. And they were astonished out of measure saying amongst themselves, who then can be saved? It was, Messiah was talking about how, how hardly a rich man can enter. But the overall question is, well, who can be saved? Like, it's so hard, right? And Yahushua looking upon them said, with men it is impossible, but not with Elohim. For with Elohim all things are possible. So truly, and this is where I say, if we keep the right heart for him, uh, being humble, being meek, like saying, Father, I know, uh, I know that... Um, I know that I need your help. Help me, guide me. You don't think a good father's going to be like, well, yeah, you want to keep my ways? I'll help you. Of course he will. Then Peter began to say unto him, lo, we have left all and have followed you. So basically Peter's like, hey, you know, we've made sacrifices. We're, we're here. We're here with you. And Yahushua answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that has left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospel's. But he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life. So he's like, hey, you're going to have persecutions here. But many that are first shall be last and the last first. John 16, 1 through 4. These things have I spoken unto you that you should not be offended. So uh, I mentioned it last week and I'll mention it again. We seem to be talking about some of the same topics every single week. But guess what? That's what our great teacher was trying to show us. And this book is filled with preparing our hearts that, hey, the road's going to be hard, but endure because it's going to be worth it because you're going to gain eternal life. These things have I spoken to you that you should not be offended. So he's like, I'm prepping you for this. This is the real prepping. Hey, don't be offended when things get hard. That's the parable of the sower. One of the, one of the, uh, one of the grounds, um, after you know they, they received the seed, the plant shot up. But um, when when uh, they suffered persecutions uh, because of the word or tribulations, by and by they were offended, right? And they fell away. So he's like telling you, be ready, gird up your loins, brother or sister. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time comes that whoever kills you will think that he does Elohim service. So back then, of course, they were martyring. In our time right now, I mean, that could change. You know, people could 
literally want to kill us for our faith like it was thousands of years ago. Right now in the spiritual, with uh, the, 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 the effects in the spiritual realm of slander and gossip and backbiting and envy and jealousy and, and just literally murdering someone in their, in their mind. Like that's what Messiah taught. You know, if you hate your brother without a cause, you're murdering him. So in this movement, in this walk, you see so much of this in a spiritual way uh, of killing your brother. And these things they will do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. A lot of people think they do, but in practice they don't. But these things have I told you that when the time shall come, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning because I was with you. A little bit further down in the same chapter, verse 33. These things I have spoken unto you that in me you might have shalom, peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And really, that's that's the challenge. Well, I've said before, it's anybody, atheist, Satanist, anybody can have love, joy, peace, patience, you know, at certain times in their life. But can it be lasting? Can it? Can you have it during tribulations, right? Is this something that, are these fruits that you can produce no matter what's going on in your life? And I think that's the challenge. Matthew seven thirteen through 14, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leads unto life, and few there be that find it. He's telling you right now, it's going to be hard, and only few are going to get in. Messiah said that, right? Matthew twenty two fourteen. For many are called, but few are chosen. And that's the scary part. There's over 2.3 billion people that profess Messiah today. That's many. That's a good portion of the population. Out of those many, only few will be chosen. And that's why I've been called to take this walk seriously and to encourage others to take this walk seriously as well. Let's go to, um, let's go back to Nazarim 16. So basically, hey, it's going to be tough, but it's going to be worth it. Not stream sixteen twenty two. Yahusha continued, "Let all who can do so empty themselves of evil. Drain yourself of it. Right, the deeds are outside, but the thoughts are within. By striving hard and chastening the flesh, not yielding to the calls of its lusts, the soul is strengthened by an inflow of spiritual food." Then Yahusha asked the disciples with him if all understood that unless they could pass the tests of the flesh, they could not know heaven. All replied that they understood. I love this passage in Nazarene. We're going to look at Nazarene 431. We've, uh, we've probably read it at least a dozen times in this study. But I'm going to read it again. It says, Yahusha said, Fear not the hostility of men, nor the wiles of the world. Rise above your conditions. So it's like we can sit around and complain. The book of Proverbs it kind of makes a joke. Uh, the sluggard or, or the the brutish man or the scorner. Or whatever. I can't remember exactly what it says, but it says, will not go outside and do work because, oh, there's a lion in the streets. Like there's always an ex- It's basically it's an extreme uh, example of an excuse. You can always make excuses. Well, I'm this way because, well, I, I can't do this because rise above your conditions. Be like the water lily, which rises out of, up out of the mud, up through the murky waters into the sunlight above. Strive always to rise above your circumstances for in striving, you gain strength. Just real quick, for in, you know, you know, for in striving you gain strength. It's like, I've said this before, those of you that understand like late weightlifting and stuff, if you just lift easy weights all the time, you'll never gain strength. You have to, you have to, it needs to be hard. You have to push through, and with that, the muscle comes back stronger. It builds back, and it gets back stronger. Well, how much more in the spirit, right? So for in striving, you gain strength. So rising above your circumstances, for in striving, you gain strength. You can say you can say to yourself and make excuses. Well, I can't do this because, or you can say, Yahuwah, I know that this is in my, this is in my way uh, of doing this or, or getting this done or whatever it may be. I, 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 you know, you know your life. Don't you think he can help you, especially if you want to do if what what you're trying to accomplish is a righteous thing? 
The man whose path through life that has been easy is never as good as the one whose path has been difficult. Life has two purposes only. So where we're at right now, to test and to teach. And for that, earth is perfect. There's many, uh, there's many aspects of like the meaning of life. And that's one of the reasons I really like the book of Enoch. It's like literally the meaning of life, why he created us, right? It was to praise and worship him. But there's other instances. Uh, there's other precepts of what life is about. And a big part of that is living in harmony with our brethren. And that seems to be the hardest part about the Torah movement. Um, from what I understand, I didn't grow up in the church, but from what I understand, even in the Christian church, loving, truly loving each other is just doesn't come natural it's not it's it's not a natural thing it's a spirit thing uh let's keep going uh let's go back to not stream 16 we're at uh verse 24 it says a disciple asked how long must men be subject to death yahushua replied so long as women bear children another asked what is the food of the ruach this is a good one because we know we can feed the flesh where we can feed the Ruach too. Yahushua said, The truly hungry man eats bitter things and enjoys them. Even so does the hungry Ruach, the hungry spirit, thrive on the bitterness of the world. The body is not nourished by bitterness and therefore enjoys food supplied by every healthful plant. If the Ruach is to be made healthy, the body must be subdued, for either the body is master or the Ruach is so what I like about this is, from what I understand about this, um, the Ruach, you know, thrives even on the bitterness uh, of the world. And to me, this this reminds me of what Paul said in Philippians 4, 11 through 13. Not that I complain of want, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. So it's, so it's like, whatever your lot in life is, be content. And I, I just had... Uh, I just had dinner with uh, a family in, in the walk uh, that, uh, you know, he's an older man. He's a janitor, and he does it with all his heart. And he looks for um, opportunities for Yah to use him. And as a janitor in this company, he's been able to spread so much uh, good the good news of Messiah, of the keeping of the commandments uh, of the Most High. And I was just, I was so ecstatic to meet a man who was completely content with his lot in life. He's a janitor, and he just shares the love of, of, of Yah and Messiah. It's amazing. So in whatever state I am, to be content. I know how to be a base, which is to be made low. And I know how to abound, which is to prosper. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and want. I can do all things in him who strengthens me. I believe that this comes from a power from within, from a ruach within, from a peace, a shalom that is given to us that cannot be substituted or compared to anything else. Sirach 2, 1 through 5, my sons, and if you're new, Sirach is also known as a book of Ecclesiasticus, not Ecclesiastes, but Ecclesiasticus, uh, which is part of the Apocrypha in the, it was part of the 1611 KJV. Uh, this was also included in the Greek Septuagint, which was uh, the canon or the Bible that was around in the time of uh, Messiah and the disciples. Anyways, it says, this is chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, it says, my son, if you come forward to serve Yahuwah, Prepare yourself for temptation, or this word can also be trials or tests. So just like we read earlier in Nazarene, life has two purposes, to test and to teach, or to teach and then to test, right? Set your heart right and be steadfast, and do not be hasty in time of calamity. So don't be, don't be quick to make some rash decisions. Wait for him. Cleave to him and do not depart, that you may be honored at the end of your life. So it's like, it's like Joseph is a perfect example. He was abased. He was made low. He was humbled for many years. His brothers uh, hated him. Uh, they sold him. He was uh, uh, falsely accused and was in prison. He was abased, but he 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 kept faith with Yah. And we we see a little bit in Genesis, but if we look at like the book of Jasher, we see that um, that he was just he was he was he was singing to Yah in the prisons. I mean, he had the right attitude. He could have been like, "Oh man, my brothers hate me. My, my they all. My father thinks I'm dead. Uh, I'm in jail. And you know what? I feel like nobody nobody cares about me. Nobody loves me. Um, all this bad stuff's happening to me. Does does Yah even care? It's just so easy. And how and how many of you are like, "Oh gosh, I'm I'm whining about 
my dishwasher being broken or something. You know what I mean? I mean, let's put things in perspective. And so he is like, he found the peace of Yah even in the bitterness of life. And I think that's what this is talking about here. Even so does the hungry Ruach thrive on the bitterness of the world. Joseph is a perfect example. He thrived on the bitterness of what was handed to him. He, uh, here, right here. Next, next verse here. Accept what is ever, accept whatever is brought upon you, and in changes that humble you, be patient. Why? Because going back to this verse, first verse, Joseph cleaved to him and didn't depart from Yahweh, even in the bitterness of that jail cell, that you may be honored at the end of your life. And that's what this is about. That's what this walk is about. This isn't it. What's next is it. That's it. And to do so, we're going to be tested, and we need to learn to test and to teach. So accept whatever is brought upon you and in changes that humble you, be patient. For gold is tested in the fire and acceptable men in the furnace of humiliation. So stick with it. Stick with him. Trust him. We talk about this all the time, but it's for our own good. That's what that's what we're going through right now. And if you're like, why, why me? Why me all the time? It seems like I can never catch a break. We got more to learn. I got more to learn. You got more to learn. We all do. I don't know about you, but I want to be ready when Messiah Husha comes back. And that's what this, that's why we're studying this book and, and the, the Bible in general and the Apocrypha. We, I, want to, I, I don't know about you. I want to learn everything about what Messiah said and how to act and how to be right in his eyes. That's where I want to be. But it says here, the body must be subdued for either the body is master or the Ruach is. This obviously takes me, takes us right to, um, uh, actually, oh, did I paste this twice? Oh, I meant to pull up the fruits of the spirit. I must have accidentally. Um, okay, we'll go over the fruits of the spirit in a minute. But um, I think about this. I think about like being content in whatever situation you're in. Um, I think about Psalm three. Uh, we're gonna listen to Psalm three tonight at the end of this uh, study by Left and Right Ministries. Probably one of the best songs I've ever heard in my entire life. Um, it says, O Yahuwah, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of me, there's no help for him in Elohim. But you, O Yahuwah, are a shield about me. My glory and the lifter up my head. I cry aloud to Yahuwah, and he answers me from his holy hill. I lie down and sleep. I wake again, for Yahuwah sustains me. I am not afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Yahuwah, deliver me, O my Elohim. For you do smite all my enemies on the cheek. You do break the teeth of the wicked. Deliverance belongs to Yah. Your blessing be on your people. Why did I read Psalm 3? I mean, this is this is from the heart of David. How many people hated him, and all he wanted to do was good, right? I mean, you had a, a point in time where he was um, king of Israel, and Absalom, his son, wanted to take over, and everyone, everyone, just millions of people are like, yeah, okay, I'll follow Absalom, like, this is David, the giant slayer. This is the one that's brought righteousness to Israel. This is the one that's uh, restored its its um, or made it uh, made all of their foes around him, all around them, to be subdued. And everyone's like, "Yeah, see ya, bye." How about Messiah? He's 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 preaching the good news. Everyone's, "Oh yeah, see ya." No, not everyone, of course. No, there was a remnant that believed, and that's turned into this uh, to where we're at today. But um, the point is, it's like no matter what's going on. You know, people are saying, hey, there's no help for him in Elohim. Elohim's not with him. Uh, Ten thousands coming against him, but you, O oh, Yahuwah, are a shield about me. You've got me. I know you do. Even though my situation looks bleak. Again, Joseph, perfect example. His situation looked bleak. He may have never gotten out of prison. I mean, think about it. If you're in there for years, you're like, I'm never going to get out of here. But he was like, I trust in you. Again, in the book of Jasher, he's singing Yah praises in the in the jail cell. Now, actually, that was the testament of Joseph. We're singing praises in the jail cell. An amazing book. If you haven't read the, the Testament of Joseph, let alone uh, the whole Testament of the Troll Patriarch series, it is, is amazing. So either the body is master or the Ruach is. And for this, I want to read uh, Galatians 5 with the fruits of the Spirit. But we're gonna, I have it uh, as a note to read it here. And it's just a few verses anyway. So we'll kind of get back to that point in a second. Uh, verse 28 says, this is chapter 16 of Natsarim. Verse 28, one of the women, Salome, who had accompanied the disciples, asked Yahushua, is it within the Torah for a man to marry and yet not lie with his wife? Yahushua answered, it is never right to live falsely or to dishonor a pledge. Always let whatever be done 
accord with the intention declared. And so, so she, I don't know why she would ask this. Um, why, like, she's like, basically, hey, is it okay for a man to marry and not, have, you know, engage in the marriage bed? And he says, it's never right to live falsely or dishonor a pledge. Why is that? Because that's actually one of the basic requirements of marriage. Exodus 21, 10 through 11. Uh, it says, if you take him another wife, her food, her raiment, and her duty of marriage shall he not diminish. And if he do not these three unto her, then she shall go out free without money. So the, the basic things that are to be provided for a, a wife is food, clothing, and duty of marriage. That means the marriage bed. So uh, if one were to be to one were to you know, marry a woman and he doesn't provide her food or raiment or the marriage bed, it says she can just go. So. What the context is exactly, uh, perhaps maybe someone, I don't know why she would ask this, maybe someone uh, wanted to marry her but said that they would live celibately, I, I don't know, I'm not sure, not sure. All right, 1630, Salome said, Master, when will the rule of Elohim come? Yehusha replied, when women place greater value on the treasures they hold, for men will strive harder for gold than for brass. When man and woman cease to pander to the flesh and become truly one in Ruach. For of this I assure you, unless man and woman exalt the Ruach above the flesh, they will not know life and glory. So here's where I want to, um, let's pull up um, Galatians 5. This is where... Um, we're going to talk about, well, the flesh versus the spirit. And this is where uh, we see here, so the body must be subdued. And this is not, talk, not talking about just eating food or, you know, like consuming alcohol. I, I think this is, your body has much more, has so much more than just that. Uh, and we'll talk about it, actually. Why, why any more words for me? Galatians five thirteen through 23. For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for... For the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, Walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Now, pause. I think mainstream Christianity teaches that walking by the Spirit is kind of just doing what comes to mind, like, Oh, the Spirit told me this, and the Spirit. No. We'll, we'll define exactly what the spirit is in a second, but it says for the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh for these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law or at least the condemnation of the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions. And I'm just going to pause real quickly. This right here is the plague of the Torah movement because you have people that, well, I, I believe it's the Pharisees all over again. They want to show just how smart they are. They want to show just how exalted they are, just how much they know and how much they want to beat other people down and they cause strife. The, this brings up jealousy. There's disputes dissensions, factions, right? Envying. So subduing the body, the body must be subdued. It's not just like, hey, okay, well, you know, I fast seven times, you know, seven days a week. Um, um, you know, you know, like the, like the Pharisee, you know, is sitting up and, oh, yeah, well, I, I, uh, I'm glad I'm not like these other people, uh, murderers and murder. I, I fast two times a week. I pay all my tithes and I do this and I do that. He wasn't very impressed. Matter of fact, Messiah wasn't very impressed with the Pharisees. I mean, for the most part, the religious leaders, the, the people who, you know, wore, uh, wore their seat down on the ground and, um, had these beautiful robes and had the nicest seats and probably men memorized the whole Torah. They probably memorized every, every verse. Um, that was a thing back then. They literally memorized uh, the scriptures. Um, they prayed for hours, but what did Messiah say? Make your words few. Don't go babbling on and on. Your father knows what you need already. And I'm not saying spending a long time in prayer is bad, but I'm saying he's not impressed. What's he impressed with? Loving him and loving people. Now, of course, that's defined by the Torah, but we got to put things in perspective. 
So more fruits of the flesh, envying, drunkenness, carousing, it's like partying, and these things... And these like things of which I forewarn you, just as I forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of Elohim. So people who aren't able to subdue the flesh won't enter the kingdom of heaven. And we all struggle with different things. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things. There is no law. So, walk in the Spirit. Because we know, we, what, we know what? We know, oh, I have Romans 8 here too. We know the law is what? We know the law is spiritual. The Torah is spiritual. Uh, let's go to Romans 8. I wanted to read Romans 8. Therefore, there is no now no condemnation for those who are in Messiah Yahusha. For the law of the Spirit of life in Messiah Yahusha has set you free from the law of sin and death. This isn't set you free from the Torah like, Yo, you're free, bird. You know, go do as you please. No. From the law of sin and death. Like, as in you sin, you die. Well, he saved us from that. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh. The law wasn't weak. The, fle the flesh is and was or was and is. Elohim did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit." For the mind set on the flesh is death. So this is not, again, this is people that uh, want to strive and want to debate and wanted to have factions and dissensions and envyings and jealousies and partyings. And, but the mind set on the spirit is life and shalom. I can attest to this. I, my former life, I lived a life of gratifying the flesh. And though I had many spurts of happiness and satisfaction it never lasted it was like it was like a temporary uh, band-aid that would stay on for a while but it would never fully satisfy i can say since i've set my mind on the spiritual things and walking in the torah of the most high and loving him and loving people with all my heart do my best i'm not saying i'm, I'm perfect but i know that once i have set my mind to do these things i have this peace in my heart that no one can take away because the mind set on the flesh is hostile towards Elohim, for it does not subject itself to the law of Elohim, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please Elohim. So look at what Paul is saying here. This is uh, Romans 8 is amazing for um, showing what we're doing is the right thing, because it says people who are set on the flesh, which we read is, you know, anger and things that are, are contrary to the Torah. So people who walk in the flesh. Um, is hostile, or the mind set on the flesh is hostile towards Elohim. It doesn't subject itself to the law, for it's not able to do so. And those who are in the flesh, who can't subject itself to the law, uh, cannot please Elohim. I and mean, there's plenty of passages in the Torah that says the, the keeping the commandments is, is doing what's pleasing to him. It shows that we love him. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of Elohim dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Messiah, he does not belong to him. If Messiah is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Yahushua from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Messiah Yahushua from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit, which dwells in you. Hallelujah. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if the spirit, or at least die to it, right? But if the spirit you are putting to death, I'm sorry. But if by the spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the spirit of Elohim, these are the sons of Elohim. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as of sons, which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of Elohim. And if children, heirs also, heirs of Elohim and fellow heirs with Messiah, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we also may be glorified with him. So this goes hand in hand with what we were starting off with. Like, hey, we're going to have tribulation. 
For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. This is what I was saying earlier. Like, hey, this is what we're dealing with now is nothing compared to what is to come if we do what's right. Anyways, um, yeah, I think we I think we read um, what I wanted to read in Romans 8. So let's go back to Nazarene 16. We are at verse uh, 32. Another woman asked, Who then shall know eternal life? Yahushua said, All will have eternal life, but not all will know it, while many will be found in a place of sorrow. This is a, a bold statement. People will be like, Ah, ah, ah. You know, this brings up really uh, a heavily deb- debated topic. Um, one which I w- would not say that I'm an ex- I'm not an expert on anything, but um, I know this has been debated for thousands of years. Um, uh, I don't know if the, it, this is the exact... Um, what it's called, but it's eternal torment or annihilation. As in, um, there's plenty of passages that support people that do wicked uh, are going to suffer after death. And it says they're going to suffer. Well, there's plenty of passages that says their suffering will, the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. And some people are like, well, no, that's that that would be a cruel, yeah. And the not cruel thing to do would just to be annihilate them and they're just gone forever. Um, I like to just let the scriptures do the talking. So it says again, he says, all will have eternal life, but not all will know it, while many will be found in a place of sorrow. So Daniel 12, 2, it says, many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So it's not just the resurrection of the just. John 5, 28 through 29, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So there's a resurrection of damnation. Acts 24, 4, 24 14 through 15, this is Paul. But this I confess unto you, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the Elohim of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. And I have hope towards Elohim, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. Revelation 21 through 3, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up, and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loose a little season. So Satan is thrown in here, and he's not annihilated. Uh, what happens to the other people that are thrown in with him? Matthew twenty five forty one. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Revelation fourteen nine through eleven. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of Elohim, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Uh, a couple other passages I'd like to read for you. Second Ezra 7. 62 through 74 and a couple of the passages it says i replied and said oh earth what have you brought forth oh by the way in case you're new uh second ezra is also known as fourth ezra um this was also included in the 1611 kjv and other uh bibles out there this was in the uh um kjv one of the most uh well-known canons through history it was included and it was taken out of the Apocrypha with the West Cohort revision in the 1800s. It says, I replied and said, O earth, what have you brought forth if the mind is made out of the dust like the other created things? For it would have been better if the dust itself had not been born, so that the mind might not have been made from it. But now the mind grows with us, and therefore we are tormented, because we perish and know it. Let the human race lament, but let the beasts of the field be glad. Let all who have been born lament, 
but let the four-footed beasts and the flocks rejoice. For it is much better with them than with us, for they do not look for a judgment, nor do they know of any torment or salvation promised to them after death. For what does it profit us that we shall be preserved alive, but cruelly tormented? This is kind of what we're talking about here. This is what Messiah is talking about here. All will have eternal life, but not all will know it, while many will be found in a place of sorrow. For all who have been born are involved in iniquities and are full of sins and burdened with transgressions. And if we were not to come into judgment after death, perhaps it would have been better for us. He answered me and said, When the Most High made the world and Adam and all who have come from him, he first, he first prepared the judgment and the things that pertain to the judgment. And now understand from your own words, for you have said that the mind grows with us. For this reason, therefore, those who would dwell on earth shall be tormented. Because though they had understanding, they committed iniquity, lawlessness, breaking the Torah. And though they received the commandments, they did not keep them. And though they obtained the law, they dealt unfaithfully with what they had received. Now, before you're like, wait a minute, only Israel received the law. It's actually not true. Uh, Noah, when the ark came to arrest, he taught all three of his sons the law and commandments. And they, it's, it, after just a few generations, they, they kicked it to the curb and did their own thing. What then will they have to say in the judgment, or how will they answer in the last times? For how long the time is that the Most High has been patient with those who inhabit the world, and not for their sake, but because of the times which he has foreordained. We're going to back up here, same chapter, but back to verse 32 through 38. It says, And the earth shall give up those who are asleep in it. This is the resurrection. And the dust, those who dwell silently in it. And the chambers shall give up the souls which have been committed to them. And the Most High shall be revealed upon the seat of judgment. And compassion shall pass away, and patience shall be withdrawn. But only judgment shall remain. Truth shall stand, and faithfulness shall grow strong. And recompense shall follow, repayment. And the reward shall be manifested. Righteous deeds shall awake, and unrighteous deeds shall not sleep. Then the pit of torment shall appear, and opposite it the place of rest. And the furnace of hell shall be disclosed, and opposite it the paradise of delight. Then the Most High will say to the nations that have been raised from the dead, Look now, and understand whom you have denied, whom you have not served, whose commandments you have despised. Look on this side and on that. Here are delight and rest, and there are fire and torments. Thus we speak to them on the day of judgment. To Ezra seven forty five through forty seven, I answered and said, "O sovereign master, I said then and say now. Listen to this, those of you right now, listen to this. Blessed are those who are alive and keep your commandments. Stay blessed. But what of those for whom I prayed?" For who among the living is there that has not sinned, or who among men that has not transgressed your covenants? And now I see that the world to come will bring delight to few, but torments to many. And I think this is the last passage here, 79 through 81. This is talking about what happens to someone after they die. This is talking about a wicked person. And if it is one of those who have shown scorn and have not kept the way of the Most High and who have despised his law and who have hated those who fear Elohim, such spirits shall not enter into habitations, but shall immediately wander about in torments, ever grieving and sad in seven ways. The first way, because they have scorned the law of the Most High. If you want to read more about what happens when you die, uh, we'll keep reading past verse 81. So, uh, is any of that uh, uh, you know is any of that conclusive uh, between the the great debate of eternal torment or annihilation? Uh, maybe not. You know, maybe even uh, in some ways, uh, some both exist. Maybe he'll have mercy on on some people, and and you know, they denied him. They don't want anything to do with him. But you know, they weren't nasty, wicked people. Maybe maybe he will give them just that. And maybe for the just really wicked people, people like. Like uh, if you remember the book of Esther, Haman, right? Maybe someone like him. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I have it on the notes here. This will be good reading uh, at home. If Second uh, Baruch forty nine, verse one through fifty one. Well, I'd say through the. I'd say chapter Second Baruch chapter forty nine, fifty and fifty one talks a little bit more about this. We also spent um, a little more uh, in detail about this in a uh, study called um, Zombies in the Bible or something like that. And um, I think we were able to demonstrate why Hollywood and why the world pushes this zombie 
uh, narrative so much? Well, uh, there's scriptures we read. There's going to be a resurrection of the just and the unjust. The just is going to go to him. They're going to meet him uh, in the clouds, which, you know, I believe in, in Mount Zion, which is Mount Zion is set above the mountains, which is set above the clouds. Um, and the wicked will remain on here on earth, wandering about in torments, basically hell on earth. Well, I mean, it is right now, too, but you know what I mean. So let's keep going. Um, we are in Nazarene 1634. She said, no woman can make a man good. And Yahushua replied, any woman can make a man better. I'd say a good, wo good woman can make a, a good man, uh, a good, can make a man better. Um, but I want to go back to last week's study, just real quick. Now, uh, not stream 16, verse 6. It says, Since the beginning, there have been male and female, each needing the other for fulfillment and spiritual flowering. For this reason, a man leaves his parents and unites with a woman, and so the two become one in flesh and ruach. The flesh is easily parted, but the united ruach, the united spirit, it is different. Therefore, when two are joined together in the union of love, which is flesh and spirit, let no act of man sever them from each other. But the point I wanted to make here is uh, they made a, made a male and female, each needing the other for fulfillment and spiritual flowering. Now, can someone live a whole life of celibacy and um, find fulfillment? Sure. Um, but the way he designed this to have real full fulfillment in this life, a man needs a woman, a woman needs a man. Straight up. I mean, obviously, we know uh, uh, we know children are a joy, and of course, um, all the things that come along with a marriage are very joyful. And then there's some things that make things really hard. Uh, but once again, you know, it, I would say it's easier. Uh, I don't know. Is it easier to live by yourself, or is it easier to live with a with you know a partner, whether a husband or wife? I don't know. It's a good question. Tell me what you think in the comments. Curious what your thoughts are. But it goes back. What the point I'm trying to make is it's going back to like, it's easy to keep Torah by yourself in a corner, right? Um, no one's around you. There's no fellowship. Uh, it's, it's easy. Torah keeping Torah is easy. The hard part and the test is doing Torah with each other. And those of you that uh, know what I'm talking about know what I'm talking about. But that's the real test. And I believe that's where the sifting really comes. Let's go back to Not Stream 16, where at verse 36, it says, When they came to a place of rest, Philip said, Master, teach us to understand our Father in heaven. In the canon, we know it says, show us the Father. Here it says, teach us to understand our Father in heaven. And if we know his nature, it will suffice. Yehusha answered, I have been with you some time, but still many of you do not understand. I do not speak of myself. But as the mouthpiece of the father, can the nature of a father be much different than that from his sons? In general, no. Sometimes, yeah. But obviously, uh, in this example, our heavenly father, the eternal being, sending his uh, son who, who was and is an eternal being, but coming as a man, uh, could the nature of a father be much different than that of his sons? Especially if Messiah is not preaching his own doctrine, but his father's that his father gave him but th i think this is just a, a a better um i think this is just better wording for what most of us already understand that messiah is not also the father you can see two beings here here's the passage in john john 14 5 through 13 thomas said unto him master we know not where you go and how can we know the way yahushua said unto him i am the way the truth and the life the no man comes to the Father but by me. I am the way, Psalm 119, 1. The truth, Psalm 119, 142. The life is uh, Proverbs 13, 14, and Deuteronomy 32, 46 through 48, I think. Um, Sai is basically declaring himself to be the Word. No one can come to the Father but through the Word, his Son. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also, and from henceforth you know him, and I've seen him. Philip said unto him, Master, show us the Father, and it suffices us. Yehusha said to him, I've have, have I been so long time with you, and yet have you not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how do you say then, show us the Father? So a lot of people will just read this and be like, well, there it is. Messiah is like, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So he's saying he's the Father. But you just got to keep reading. Believe you not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? 
The words that I speak into you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me, he does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say to you, he that believes on me, the works that I shall do, he shall do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. So he's not saying I go to myself. Uh, and whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Hebrews 1.3, who being, this is talking about Messiah, who being the brightness of his glory. So Messiah is the brightness of Yahuwah's glory and the express image of his person. So it's like if you were to if you were to take all the elements of the Father and put him in a uh, human form, this is what he would look like, his son, his perfect image, right? And upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Praise, yeah. No offense to anyone that believes that Messiah is the Father. I'm not trying to belittle you or belittle what you think. Um, I'm just, I'm called to share what I understand uh, and what I believe the scriptures are saying. So, uh, no offense. All right, let's keep going. Not stream 1638. I teach you about Yahuwah the Father, for you have to carry my words to others, and spoken thus they will understand. But he is not quite like earthly fathers, for his wisdom is infinitely greater. Think of an earthly father and magnify his greatness and goodness, his wisdom and justice, his sense of discipline and compassion a thousand times, and you glimpse Yahuwah the Father Hazley, how awesome it is, especially for some of us that, that did not grow up with great uh, fatherly um, figures in our life. For a lot of us, we've finally found the father that we've we've always wanted. For some of you, you, gr you grew up with great fathers, praise Yah, and had a great example uh, on earth, and uh, hallelujah to that. But praise Yah for the father we've always been looking for, hallelujah. One of the women not yet a disciple, approached the place where Yahushua sat and said, I have been harshly treated by the Torah concerning a daughter's inheritance. How do you interpret it? Yahushua said, I interpret all laws with mercy and compassion, but justice must not be put aside in their favor. It is written that if a man dies without fathering his son, his inheritance shall become the daughter's, but his wife shall not be deprived of her portion. Yet when there are sons, a daughter is not deprived of her portion. Therefore, the inheritance should be divided equally among sons and daughters. So we know, we know that um, we know about this part because in Numbers, um, the end of it, it's, I think it's like thirty-three to thirty-six, talks about the the daughters of Zelophehad and how he had no son, and and so she's like, he came to Moses, hey, what's going on? You know, um, my father did not bear a son. What's going on? And so that was the decree to give it to the daughters, which it was was uh, t uh, spoken about here. And also in the Torah, we get a lot about the firstborn's double portion, but we don't get a lot of information to of what to cons what to do concerning others. So this is why he's saying, uh, "I interpret all laws with mercy and compassion." Mercy and compassion. So obviously, you know, if 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 one, we, you have to interpret the Torah. It doesn't spell out every single situation. Um, and in, in, in the Torah, I believe we get the heart of the Father. And I believe what Messiah is saying is we have to interpret these laws with mercy and compassion. And so he's basically saying, or what I think he's saying, uh, in my opinion, is there's there's plenty of laws or, that talk about the daughter's inheritance, talks about the, du uh, the, the double portion for the firstborn. But there's not a lot of discussion, um, Torah-wise, about what to do with all the other children or even the wife that's left behind. So I think this is great information uh great information here um that it says therefore that the inheritance should be divided equally among the sons and daughters of course what's remaining from after the firstborn getting the double portion which is a torah commandment um we'll look at uh, we're gonna look at not stream 9 30, 941 <clears throat> if you've got the pdf it's uh, page 93 in the physical book, it's not page 93, so just ignore that. So, Nazarene 941 says, I have not come to abolish the Torah or to change the teachings of the prophets, but to complete them, adding necessary clarification and interpreting them to the understanding of men. So, this is what he came to do. We'll talk more about what he came to do in a bit. So, I think he's, I, I, I don't know if you, about you, but when I read this, when I read this, this this seems very fair and interpreted with mercy and compassion, without loosing uh, 
the right ruling or what's just. Verse 41 of, six, of chapter 16 in Atzerim, all women should have a rightful portion at marriage, but it would be unseemly for any woman to be to contend with her kinsmen for it. No woman should ever seek a husband because of what she may gain from such marriage, for this makes her a deceiver, denying him the joy of love. There's real love and there's fake love. Some of you that have been in uh, relationships before, you know this. You know that someone was with you for... Um, Maybe something physical, you know, it could have been, uh, could have been money, could have been possessions, could have been, uh, you know, something else physical. And some of us, uh, hopefully all of us know the difference of real love and false love, or maybe even love versus lust. So again, no woman should ever seek a husband because of what she may gain from such marriage. For this makes her a deceiver, denying him the joy of love. No woman should ever snare a man into lust or seek a husband so she can leave her father's house. For this is a wrong against her husband. No woman having committed fornication should ever go to a man as a wife. For in giving herself cheaply to one and dearly to another, she shames and insults her husband. If she loved him, how could she say, give much for that which I freely bestowed on another? Better for her to say, as with him, so with you. I'm a, I, I would say, I really think this is uh, talking about more so of like the dowry, the, the bride price. Um, just kind of how I understand it. Uh, Natsrim 1643, a man built a house taking care with the decoration, decorating and its furnishings. Then going to a friend, he said, because of my affection for you, I will give this house to you as a gift. I know this is not usual, but I have so much affection for you that I willingly disregard the common custom of men. Later, he built another house and taking the furnishings, which were no longer new from the first house, put them into the second Going to another friend, he said, I have a house which, because of my affection for you, I will sell at the usual price with yearly rental for the furnishings. Now, for which of these friends did he have the greatest affection? Would not the second man justly feel he had been treated badly in relation to the first? Would it not have been fairer to have treated both alike? The Torah is to wear the clothes of purity, and to absorb the words of the holy books is to be anointed with wisdom. For the holy books of wisdom are weavers preparing the garments of eternal life in glory. They are available to all and may be either accepted or ignored. And to, to me, what I see when I see to absorb the words of the holy books, I really I feel like this is talking about putting into practice because, again, we can sit here. We can we can stop everything we're doing and just read scripture all day long for the rest of our lives. Literally wake up. 6 a.m. reading all day until 10 o'clock at night, go to bed, wake up, do it all over again. But if you don't ever put that stuff into practice, what good is it done? And that's why I like what it's, the wording here, to absorb, to the Torah is to wear the clothes of purity. To absorb the words of the holy books is to be anointed with wisdom. For the holy books of wisdom are weavers preparing the garments of eternal life and glory. Yeah, I'll stop there. I just see action there like the, the, it's it's you're walking out these words james 1 22 through 25 says be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves so if you're only hearing the word and you're not applying it to your life you're a deceiver you're deceiving yourself for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass for he beholds himself and goes his way and straightway forgets what manner of man he was but who looks into the perfect law of liberty, it's the Torah, and continues therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Revelation 19, 1 through 8. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and honor and power unto Yahweh our Elohim, for true and righteous are his judgments, for he has judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and has avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia! And her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped Elohim that sat on the throne, saying, Amen. Alleluia! And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our Elohim, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. 
And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Say with me, Hallelujah! For Yahweh omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Now, why did I pick this? I'm looking at here. It says, For the holy books of wisdom are weavers preparing the garments of eternal life in glory. I kind of see that right here. She should be arrayed. In, so, so she made herself ready. How do we make ourselves ready? Well, to do what Yahuwah has commanded us. To do what Yahusha has commanded us. That's to be ready. And it says, she was arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. This is someone who abode in the holy books of wisdom. And when they're making these changes in their lives, are weavers preparing the garments of eternal life in glory. Isaiah 49, 13 through 18. This is talking about New Jerusalem. Sing, O heavens, and be joyful, O earth, and break forth into singing, O mountains, for Yahweh has comforted his people and will have mercy upon his afflicted. But Zion said, New Jerusalem, I believe in this context, Yahuwah has forsaken me, and my master has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her suckling child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget. So he's saying, like, obviously, um, you know, a woman doesn't forget her child, although in this day and age, um, I'm sure it's very possible. And he's saying here, yeah, they may forget, yet oh, will I not forget you. Behold, I have graven upon you the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. Your children shall make haste. Your destroyers and they that made you waste shall go forth of you. Lift up your eyes round about, and behold, all these gather themselves together and come to you. As I live, says Yahuwah, you shall surely clothe you with them all, and, with, and as with an ornament, bind them on you as a bride does. Isaiah 61 10 I will greatly rejoice in Yahuwah my soul shall be joyful in my Elohim for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation he has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with jewels and you can see the same thing right here as I live says Yahuwah you shall surely clothe you with them all as with an ornament and bind them on you as a bride does so I just uh, while we're here there's another debate that seems to be endless. Um, some people say that the bride is New Jerusalem and not the people. And some people say it's the people and not New Jerusalem. Well, here, what I love here is especially with these two verses, you can connect them together. It basically says, uh, as, I li as I live, you shall surely clothe you with them all. Well, who's it talking about? Your children as with an ornament and bind them on as a bride does. So literally the people become like part of the building. Uh, and it says here, right, it says, He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. So uh, what am I? What position I'm taking? I'm saying the people are literally part of New Jerusalem, whether you want to call them ornaments or, the you know, decked in the, in the, the wedding attire. The people are literally part of it. And, that's, and we know also... Um, First Peter 2 5 says that you are living stones built up a spiritual house. <clears throat> uh, Paul says, don't you know that you're temple of Elohim? And it says that we are um, fitly joined together, forming the house of Elohim. So I don't think it's one or the other. I think it's both. I think the people are are literally part of New Jerusalem, and New Jerusalem is the bride. The people of the bride, New Jerusalem is the bride. And it's not like a, a traditional wedding we have here. This is like a covenant, just like um, when they left Egypt. They went to uh, Mount Sinai. They got married there. And it wasn't like, you know, Yah or Yahusha taking, you know, them as wife. And, you know, it's not, not like the marriage we understand today. It's a covenant. It's an agreement. And Yah, Yahusha, the building, us, we all come together in the covenant, in agreement. We are going to be as one. Messiah's, remember Messiah's prayer in... Uh, John 17, he said, uh, he says that he prayed, he's, he's praying. 
that they may be one. He's talking about the people, his disciples, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be one in us. So the goal is that we all are together in covenant. And the you know marriage here on earth is the is the closest thing that we understand of a covenant. Hey, I will be faithful to you. I will provide you with this. Um, I will keep these laws, ordinances. It's an agreement. And for this, uh, these are the benefits you will get. Let's go to uh, Nazarene 1645. The kingdom of heaven is like a king giving a wedding feast who, moving about among his guests, notices a man without a wedding garment. The king says to him, My friend, why did you come here attired like this when it makes you completely out of place? The man can make no answer. So the king calls his servant and says, Turn him out, for he does not fit here. This is away from me, you worker of iniquity. This is the wise virgin not ready. This is the person who did not listen to the holy books, which are weavers preparing the garments of eternal life and glory. They did not do this. Therefore, they did not have the garment. Therefore, that servant was kicked out. Away from me, you worker of iniquity. Second Corinthians 5, 1 through 4, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of Elohim, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so, that, I'm sorry, if so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, for not that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up in life. In a very opposite way, Exodus 32, 25, and when Moses saw that the people were naked, this is the, the, this is the golden calf. When Moses saw the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies. This is not the same naked like without clothing. This is like a, like a shame, like a great shame. Uh, and obviously, um, we saw that they just just transgressed the law that they were just given not to have any uh, idol statues, not to worship graven images. They did that, and they did that to their own nakedness and to their own shame. Matthew twenty two. This is the this is the the kingdom of heaven. Um, I just want to read right here. After Israel was destroyed, um, he says. Here, here, here it says, but when the king heard thereof, he was wroth and sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burnt up their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore, this is the gospel, this is going to preach the gospel unto all the nations. Go therefore into the highways and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So whoever wants to hear this, this call, come. So the servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here with not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. He's like, I don't know, I don't know what to say. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. So what we're learning here is that we're saved by Messiah. We're saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves, not of works, lest any man boast. However, in the next verse it says we're created for good works. And what we see here is people who don't change their lives, people who abide in the flesh. Paul said it, if you walk in the flesh, if you don't chasten your life, you don't chasten um, the things that you have, have to need to work on, you're not going to enter. You're just not going to enter. So that's what we have before us. That's the great contest that's before us. Are we going to have faith and obedience or not? That's the test. It's the great contest. Good versus evil. Um, that's Reem 1646. Let all, me, let all men be just and merciful towards one another. For all who are... who. For all who are will not be overlooked in the life to come. This is this is the weightier matters of the law, just and merciful towards one another. But those who act otherwise shall surely suffer. Those who pander to people in high places or who distort the Torah of Yahuwah to suit their own ends or twist them to serve unintended purposes shall not be overlooked at the accounting. How we treat one another, so important. Second Peter 1, 5-14, through 14, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. So everything starts with faith. Faith is the base of our walk. It starts with faith. So add to your faith virtue, which is righteous living, and to virtue knowledge, knowledge of the scriptures, knowledge temperance, which is self-control, subduing the body as what uh, Messiah said earlier, and to self-control patience, 
and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness. So look at this. So brotherly kindness is should be the grand finale of our walk. Everything should be pointing towards this, loving Yah and loving people. That's why Messiah boldly said those are the two most important commandments. And to brotherly kindness, charity, or love, right? Love. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our master, Yahushua HaMashiach. But he that lacks these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, like secure, steadfast, your entrance into heaven, secure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Master and Savior, Yahushua HaMashiach. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and be established in the present truth. So, again, Peter's like, I'm repeating this stuff. You already know this, but I'm repeating it so you know. Don't forget. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, this body, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our master Yahushua has shown us. Romans 12, 10 through 21, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the master, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality, bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not, rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind towards one another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Bring yourself down. Be not wise in your own conceit, conceits. Repay to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible as much as it's within you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says Yahuwah. Therefore, if your enemy hungers, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. For in so doing, you shall heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Hallelujah. Romans thirteen eight through 14 Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loves another has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not kill, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So he's, he's, he's quoting, uh, you know, commandments 6 through 10. That shows us how to love people. Commandments 1 through 5 shows us how to love Yah. Love norks no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, which this movement is plagued with. But Pete, but put you on the master Yahushua HaMashiach, and make not provision for the flesh, to fulfill the lust thereof. Hebrews 12, 14 through 15, follow peace or shalom with all men, not just our brethren, and holiness without which no man shall see Yahweh. You can't you you can't figure out a way to find peace with people. You won't you it says you won't see Yahweh. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of Elohim, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Let's go to Natsarim 1647. There are those who interpret the Tara, the Torah narrowly, so that while not taking the clothes from the widow's back, they will take her house and milk cow and drive the fatherless children from their home. They justify themselves saying, this is the Torah. And was not her husband a debtor? Many are the devious roads followed by the hypocrites, for this is a wrongful interpretation of the Torah. Now, this is a really interesting passage because Deuteronomy 20, what this is talking about here is Deuteronomy 24, verse 17 says, You shall not pervert the judgment of the stranger, nor of the fatherless, nor take a widow's raiment to pledge. So if you just, if, if this is so this is what people do. They isolate that and say, well, okay, we're not taking her raiment, we're not taking her clothing, 
right? And so this is what Messiah is saying right here. There are those who interpret the Torah narrowly so that while not taking the clothes from the widow's back, they will take her house and milk cow and drive the fatherless children from their home. So literally, while if you continue reading, this is basically showing how you're to have compassion. When you cut down your harvest in your field and has forgot a sheaf in the field, you shall not go again and fetch it. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow that Yahweh Elohim may bless you in all the work of your hands. The rest of this is all talking about the about taking care of the fatherless, the stranger, the widow. So uh, this is what this is what this is what wicked people who do wicked things with the Torah do. They're like, okay, so look, we're not taking her raiment, raiment to pledge, but we'll take her house and her cow and all these other things because her husband died and left debt. And so that debt's got to be paid. Or they can recognize the heart of the father and say, hey, you know what? They, he, he, he said not to take her clothing, but maybe I should interpret it this way. Maybe I should say, well, if he's saying don't take her clothing, why on earth would I take her cow? Why on earth would I take her house? If I read the Torah and interpret it with, with a right heart and with justice, I should take care of this widow. We should, we should just write off the debt. I mean, Yahweh's got it written in his Torah every seven years we write off the debt. Can't we just write it off? I mean, she's a widow. She doesn't have the money. But no, they do it another way. An example. There's many examples of what people do, but this is something. One, this is one I just heard of recently. Exodus 28 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Shabbat of Yahweh your Elohim. In it, you shall not do any work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your manservant, nor your maidservant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger that is within your gates. For in six days Yahweh made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So there's people that read this and say, well, this is just talking about uh, me, my son, my daughter, my manservant, my maidservant, or the stranger that's in within my gates. So, hey, on Shabbat, I can just go out to dinner. I can go out to, I can go out to lunch. And they're not my maidservant. They're not my, like, really? How about the heart of Yahuwah is that the Sabbath was made for all mankind. I mean, even Messiah says it. So the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And so there's people who interpret it narrowly. So, well, it doesn't say my wife can't work. It only says me, my son, daughter, manservant, maid, or... We would say it's saying this and maybe the heart of the father is that nobody should work on the Shabbat. Now we know the, the priests had to do their, their deal, but you know, we're getting the heart of it. Now, of course, if you look, you know, just past the Torah, we look at the, you know, the, the writings, we look at the book of Nehemiah and, you know, Nehemiah was, was mad at them because they were doing business uh, on the Shabbat with other people, you know? So anyways, we should, if we have the right heart, if we're humble, if we're meek, because he says in Psalm 25, 9, he teaches the humble his way. He doesn't teach the proud. We should be able to read this and get the heart of the Father. The heart of the Father is obviously that no one should work on the Shabbat, not just our own kind. People say, well, you know, they're not, they don't follow Torah, so who cares, you know, who cares? Like, are you serious? That, I think, is on the same, same level of totally distorting what the Torah was trying to say. Um, all right, we're going to finish up here. Not stream 1648. The holy books of the Yahudim say that an eye shall be taken for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but the words of the Torah must be interpreted with justice. And, and I just want to say in general, I think the eye for the eye, tooth for tooth is like a maximum punishment. I think everything we see in the, in the Mishpat team or the right rulings is a maximum punishment. Now, can there be mercy? Of course, because Yah said that if we sin, we die, but he's had mercy and compassion on us. Now, can we have mercy and compassion with each other? Sure. I just want to start with that basic premise of how I understand eye for eye, tooth for tooth. That is a maximum punishment. But now, listen to this. I, I love this. It says, For if an eye be taken from he who put out another's, or a tooth from someone who has knocked out the tooth of another, is the loss made good in this manner? He's like, is it really made law? Is it really made good? Like, let's say you accidentally poke out someone's eye. It, it, does it really, is it really, his, is, is his eye made good really if my eye is taken out? He's, he's asking. Now, even, even more so, if a one-eyed man causes him with two eyes to lose one, shall he be made blind and so suffer a great loss? That's a good question. Or if a man with two eyes causes a man with one eye to be made blind, shall he lose both? Henceforth, which means from this time forward, 
let the loss be made good in silver or through labor. For now, the law of revenge, because we know only Yahweh takes revenge, shall be overruled by the law of retribution, which means repayment. All laws shall now be administered under the rule of recompense, repayment. All these things I give to you that they may be established and added to the Torah so that henceforth they may be used in judgments among the just. Now remember, he get, he commanded Yahuwah, we talked about this last week, you know, can Yahushua add to the Torah? Um, well, the commandment was given to the children of Israel not to add Messiah. He is the lawgiver. Um, he is the word. He is the Torah made flesh. So if he, I want to say this is added interpretation, you know, can he do that? Yes. Um, Isaiah 48, 21, it says, Yahuwah is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. So Messiah was going to come and do something to the law. Freshen it up, make it make it more, um, well, it says, it says he'll magnify the law, make it great and make it honorable. And it's not saying that there was something wrong with it, but obviously, if we see what people did with like divorce and how they're like, hey, you can divorce for any cause. Uh, you can you can divorce because your wife you know ruined your dinner. Uh, you know, is it possible that they they misused the eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, and Messiah had to come set it right and be like, listen, we're just going to settle this thing with silver and labor. To me, that makes sense. To me, that may, that resonates in my heart. That makes more sense than if I accidentally caused someone's eye to go out. That I gotta lose an eye. How about you know, repayment with silver or or work? I, that to me that makes sense. It makes total sense. I got a note here. The targum. The this is the Aramaic of Isaiah forty two. Oh, that's okay. All right. I was just gonna show that that Isaiah forty two was clearly about Israel. Well, yeah. Why not? It says, but behold, my servant, the Messiah, whom I bring, my chosen in whom one delights. As for my word, I will put my set apart ruach upon him. He shall reveal my judgment unto the nations. All right, the rest we don't even have to read. It's right here. It's all right there. Messiah is right there. Um, and I'm just sharing that because, you know, a lot of people are, not a lot of people, but people are denying Messiah and accusing him of all sorts of things. And I'm here to defend him. I'm here to defend his honor. Uh, not stream 1650. I come to open the eyes, the blind eyes of ignorance, to rescue the captives confined in dungeons, dungeons of delusion, and to free men from the shackles of the flesh. I come to quicken the dead in Ruach, to heal the wounds of worldly woes, and to comfort the despairing. Hallelujah for what he came to do. Just want to show that this is showing that there was a spiritual aspect to what his call was. This is uh, Isaiah 61. This is all about Messiah and what he'd do. The spirit of Yahweh Elohim is upon me because Yahweh has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the open of the prison to them that are bound. And so you can see here, this is a, a spiritual open blind eyes of ignorance, rescue the captives to confined in dungeons of delusions, or even sin, free men from the shackles of the flesh, from sin, quicken the dead in the spirit, heal the wounds of the worldly woes, and comfort the despairing. Hallelujah for what our Messiah came to do. What he, what has he done for you? Reflect. Hasn't he done these for you? I can say yes to all these things for me. About this time, some of the Pharisees who inclined towards Yahushua came to warn him that certain men of Herod sought to do him harm, advising him to leave. Yahushua said, if anyone intends to report my whereabouts to Herod, let him do so. That's faith right there. It's almost like it's like today. <clears throat> hey, you gotta you gotta hide or else the government's gonna find you and, and do this and this to you. Okay. Like where are we gonna hide? Let's follow Messiah. If anyone here, let's just say, if anyone intends to report my whereabouts to the whoever authorities. Let him do so. But I will not leave until the third day when my work here is complete. You have a mission. I have a mission. You have a mission. So why are we so scared about what the world wants to do to us? He put his whole life in Yahweh's hands. And we are to do the same because we're supposed to walk as he walked. Psalm 3 verse 6. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Why? Because Yahweh is our shield and our protector and he hears us. We're going to sing Psalm 3 in just a second. 
He then went to his disciples to Alon, where he rested among the trees for seven days, teaching them the secrets of hidden things. On the seventh day, men of Kodesh came out of Yehuda, and Yehusha said, Beware of these, for they betrayed their own fathers and pollute whatever is clean. Then Yehusha and those with him departed. And that is the end of chapter 16. So let's pray, brothers and sisters, and then we're going to we're going to do Psalm 3, one of my favorite songs by Left and Right Ministries. <clears throat> Father Yahweh, we just come before you in Yahushua's name, and then we thank you for these words. We thank you for uh, books like this and others like Enoch and the Apocrypha that men have told us for centuries not to read. But Father, your spirit is saying, hey, I've, lay, I've, I've kept these words for you, and we thank you, Father. We thank you that you're allowing us to grow closer to you. Father, help us. Uh, help us protect us from the enemy and the wiles of the devil. Be our shield as you are Yahushua's shield, as you are David's shield and Abraham and many of the greats. Be our shield, Father. Help us. Don't let the enemy knock us off course, Father. Help us to keep our minds on your straight path and neither going to the left or to the right. In Yahushua's mighty name, amen, hallelujah. Shabbat shalom, brothers and sisters. We're going to do Psalm 3. Um, yeah, willing, we'll see you next week. Shabbat shalom. Do I have Psalm 3? <gasps> I've been talking about Psalm 3. No, do I not even have it? Mm, I'll find it. I'll find it. It's coming. Until then, while I'm looking for it, brothers and sisters, don't forget Passover uh, is coming soon. Um, the camping dates are April 23rd through May 2nd. It's going to be in Lebanon, Missouri. Uh, we camp out with a big group and, and uh, we do the Passover meal and celebrate uh, for seven days. So um, just go to parableofthevineyard.com and the registration link is there if you'd like to learn more or if you'd like to come. So... Um, live stream songs. Where is Psalm 3? There you are. Praise ya. Oh, Yahuwah, all my adversary. Many rise up against me, many are saying to me, there's no deliverance for him. And hello, he
Mountain. 